All right, guys, welcome back to the Rick Shields Golf Show podcast, episode 162. Um, I'm your host, Rick Shields. I'm here with co-host Guy, but this is a guest episode. Yes. And a big guest, an exciting guest. Yes. Now, Guy, you weren't present for this. I wasn't. So this is kind of new for you as well. Yep. Um, We have today on the episode, Ricky Fowler. Wowzers. So we filmed this while we're out in uh, Jupiter, Florida, at his home golf course, Medalist, which is an amazing place. And even in more breaking news, <laughs> the match, me versus Ricky Fowler, is out tomorrow, Wednesday. Big wow. day. Wow. Big day. I've seen a little bit of this footage so far. What a tough golf course. <laughs> Are you glad you weren't playing it? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> Ricky Fowler was bombing it. So I'm going to say, I'm going to give too much away. He is bombing it. And um, you have definitely got your work cut out, even though you're getting a 10-shot head start. Yes. From the bits you saw of me, though? Yeah, no comment. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, great. Um, Anyway, that video is going to be coming out tomorrow. I think you're going to really, really enjoy it. But on today's episode, we have Ricky Fowler. We're going to come on to uh, loads of stories that we we talked to him about, um, from the fact of his struggles. Yes. Like he was very open about that. For the last couple of years, he's really struggled with his golf game. I could relate, <laughs> um, but not to his level. He was he was top 10 player in the world, and he's dropped right down the rankings. He's not won for a few years. He's really kind of, I would, the biggest blip in his career so far. Yeah, well, you, you know, you can relate because you were the top 15 golfer in Salford <laughs> for a little period last year, and then I started turning it up, and then you got knocked out of the top 15. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> So yeah, this this is a really good episode. He dives into his his switching of golf coaches. He talks about going back to Butch Harmon, which who he started with, which famously is Tiger Woods' golf coach from back in the day. Um, but his kind of journey, he's just become a father. He's got married a couple of years ago. His life's changing. Um, so we kind of dive into all of that. I also get an opportunity to ask him some of your questions from the fans listening and watching. So I asked some hard-hitting questions. Mm. And towards the end of the podcast, as much as this isn't investigative journalism, <laughs> we did touch on the new tours, Ooh. Live, PGA, GC World. So there's a little bit of his take on that as well. Nice. Well, yeah, that's, um, I think, you've, did you have about 45 minutes with him? Yeah. So by the length of this podcast that you're looking at or watching now, you'll know how long we talk for first. So don't, not offend if you want to skip forward, uh, but don't because we want to quickly digest the last episode of Break 75 the wonderful Ely Golf House, I think it's called. It's not just called like Golf Club, it's got like a funny name. I think it's Ely Golf House. Yeah, Golf House it is. What a golf course. What a venue to what? start off with. Yeah. It's it's really tucked away. It's about 20 minutes away from St. Andrews. When we arrived, it was just literally a sign off the off the main road, Ely Golf Club up here. And as you drove up, it, it, it felt much more like a sports complex. Yes. Like there was tennis courts, there was bowling greens, there was a really nice driving range, there was a, a little mini golf course there, there was, there was lots of things going on. Not the day we particularly turned up, there was nothing going on. Because I don't think many more than 10 people played that day. We picked the worst day ever for weather. It was windy, it was raining, it was cold. It was it was everything that you don't want a golf round to be. However, that is the true test of Lynx golf. Your game is trending in the right way. You know, I'll give you some credit where credit's due. Thank you. Um, but that was a true test of Lynx golf. It was quite an open golf course, to be fair. So you couldn't really lose a golf ball. However... Um, it was windy. There was holes that were very short par fours, but then went into the face. They were actually playing quite long. Yeah. There was then long par fours that wind behind were playing short. Um, little spoiler, if you've not watched it, we are going to give Rick's score away because it was obviously on Friday. You shot 73. I did. Par 70. So you got your breaks at your five. You cushed it into smithereens. <laughs> it was a par 70. It's helped a little bit, but still, that's not. Um, but your golf scored. I'm yeah. feeling it. It's getting there. It was a really interesting round of golf on um, at Ely. I felt, and I, I might have spoke about it at the start of the video, or at least I have after. I When I turned up there, and even though the, the weather was bad and it was a horrible day, um, I never expected to shoot a big number. Like I just knew That's that confidence. I just knew that I, I would have been surprised mm. because it, it was actually filmed the day after Crail. Yeah. So I'd obviously played really good at Crail. And <clears throat> I just kind of went into that round thinking, you know, even if it's a bad day, I can't see this being a massive number. And I made a couple of silly mistakes. I made a, a really silly double bogey on like the fifth hole, which really frustrated me. 
But what was nice about this round of golf, and I've not had this for a while, I made four or five birdies. Yeah. And I think that's needed. You know, I'm always going to make bogeys, as you do, and most people listening and watching will do. But to shoot a good score and to try and start trying to hopefully break par or at least always break 75, you've got to throw in a handful of birdies. Absolutely. And that was something uh, with my own game. I know it's not necessarily about me, but I was really happy because I was three over par through four holes. And mm. as you said in the video, this is one of those rounds now where it can go one way or the other. The, the most obvious way it normally goes is that three over par becomes four, becomes five, becomes six, and before you know it, you've shot 92. Or you can get a few pars in a row, kind of steady the ship, and maybe roll in a cheeky little birdie. And before you know it, you're kind of two over par through nine. Yeah, your, your game of golf this in this episode, in the Ely episode, was much more like you were almost fighting on to that kind of score line, mm. and, and you held on to it really well to finish with a 74. Yeah. So like, obviously you broke 75 as well, but like you're almost like... The, they were, even though the scores were so close together it felt like we'd done them in different ways Abs yeah I gave a lot of shots away early um, but that's the thing sometimes and it sounds silly and obviously whenever you go and play golf you'd clearly go and rather shoot the best score possible obviously that's the point of golf but sometimes I quite like those rounds of golf where you have a bit of a bad start but really kind of steady the ship and come in with a score it might not be record breaking but you can feel kind of really proud of because on the flip side if you go out and play really well and then bogey like the last four in a row that's that horrible feeling you get in the car like, oh what did i do there there's but, a different different mental psyche let's say the last four or five holes that you played so i know you birded 17 did you were you, you probably one under for the last four or five something holes, like that yeah one under a level let's say you were one under for those last four or five holes and shot 74 okay mm -hmm. which you did it's a very different psyche if you were if you made double bogey bogey on the last two to shoot 74 exactly like they almost feel like completely two separate rounds of golf don't they you come away disappointed if that was the case where sometimes starting double bogey bogey you're like okay well that's that out of the way i don't mind starting yeah. horrendously sometimes because it's like right well that's that out of the way i'm now going to just fight all the way through these Absolutely, 16 holes what a golf course um really really enjoyed that and we've said this before we'll say it again there's so many amazing golf courses in scotland these little kind of hidden gems um, and it's certainly if you're from the States and you've not played Lynx golf or you've not been to the coast like that, it is so different, isn't it? I'm just going to pull up something. I know it's one of the oldest golf courses. Was it the third or seventh? Something like that. I can't fully remember. <laughs> Between not three not and said, seven. not why I said that. It's definitely not four, five or six. Because um, I'm sure Crail was one of the others. If Crail was the seventh oldest, I'm sure Ely is was Is there the a third. bit of like old wives' tale in Scotland, you think? Because every golf course is where the oldest golf course, and there's like an asterisk, it's got 18 holes, a putting green, a chipping green, a stimulator indoor, and a good pro shot. There's always some little asterisks, isn't there, after it? <laughs> Well, that, that is the thing, like, no one was around. Nobody nobody knows when these golf courses were made. And mm. also, what symbolises it actually being made and completed? Because mm. there's a separation between golf being played on that land yeah. and actually it becoming a golf course. That's very true. Because a bit like St Andrews, like, golf was played on that land, but when did it actually become, right, we're going to put a flag here, we're going to put a tee there, you know, let's say tomorrow we went to a local park which wasn't a golf course and started playing golf well we're playing golf on that park technically we might be the first people to ever play golf on that park but it's not a golf course ah, yeah you know and that's where you get a lot of these wives tales or these kind of um unclear facts about the origins of golf like do you remember when we went to the golf museum at st andrews yeah and there's loads of stories about golf actually being created in was it somewhere like norway or denmark I think or, yeah they even think china as well i'm sure because there was a there was a variation or some sort of adaptation of a ball and a stick being yeah. hit towards a target quick one for you then rick we go to a park tomorrow right we do start playing <laughs> golf before you know it it becomes the rick shields golf club okay yeah i want you to give me five things so we build it right okay you have to give me five things that your golf club would have that are quite kind of run-of-the-mill. So things that you like from current golf clubs, where that might be as simple as it has a clubhouse, that could be one, right? Okay, okay. so five things like that. But I also want to give me five things that your golf club would have that is different, that's innovative, that shows that you are a man of the future. Okay, so the five things it would have... What's it called, by the way, first of all? Um, is it the Rick Shields Golf Club? Have you got, like, some different name, like... Hooker's Lane. <laughs> that's a different club. <laughs> we'll talk about that at a different time, Guy. That's a, that's a different bit side of the business. You know that. We don't talk about that on air. Um, Hooker's Lane. Yeah, I'm not sure about that, but it's got a ring to it. it. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Wow. Um, so, yeah, may, maybe we look at... I'm, I'm, let, we'll, we'll come up with a, a name soon. Um... For me, it's going to have many, many different tees 
Okay. So, so you're going for the different things first, or so. Oh yeah, sorry. Let's go five, five normal things. Five things that you would have that you like from a normal golf club. A really, really good practice area. Okay, that's good. Okay, grass tee, mm-hmm. Pro V ones, a bit like what I spoke about in last week's podcast. What I saw a little bit out in Jupiter. Okay, nice. A really, really good practice green. That's number okay. two. Yeah. But it's it's a little bit quirky. Actually, even though it's, it can be used as a practice green, you can also have a it has like a little nine hole putting course on the green as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Like so that. That's new, two. new, but the same. Yeah. That's, yeah. Okay. It would have a really, really friendly, borderline over friendly. He's been accused of being over friendly a few times before. Starter. Okay. Like a so, Malcolm. Like yeah, the first guy you meet. Yeah. And he greets you out the car. Mr. Charnock, nice to see you again, sir. And he gets a little bit in your personal space. Okay. But he's lovable. He stands a bit too close to you. There's nothing dodgy about him. Let's not cause any accusations. No, no but there has been rumours. There has been rumours. <laughs> but he stands a little bit too close. But he's nice. Um, and then it would have a re- unbelievable pro shop. Okay. Hard like, work and soft goods. Unbelievable. Merch. Everything you could ever want. Yeah. Like, it's got everything. And... The average spending there is upwards of seven hundred and seventy-five dollars. Wow, <laughs> dollars? Where have, <laughs> I, gonna make where have I come from? Like, I know. Sorry, 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 sorry. So five hundred pounds. Yeah, I've converted that from dollars to pounds. <laughs> five hundred pounds. Um, and then so there's four, I think there's four things so far. Yeah. So n- number five. What about like, a really nice changing room? I think that's a key. Mm, no boring. Number, number five. We're not. Um, what be a good one? It's very easy to navigate from the from the car park to all of the pit stations that you want to go to. <laughs> okay. So whether it's driving range, pro shop, putting green clubhouse, grab grab some food before you go and play, see Malcolm on the starter to the tee. Okay. Like it's not complex. Okay. There's not going bit, back and forth. Bit bland that one, but I'll let you have it. I like that one. Right. Okay, let's have your five exciting ones. So these are five things at the Rick Shields Golf Club, aka Hooker's Lane, that you would not normally see at a golf club. So talk to me. Zero dress code. Wow, okay. Zero. Yep. Okay. Clothes on or? You have to have clothes on. Okay, even a t-shirt. Vest. Gonna wear a vest. Wear whatever you want. Okay. Okay. There's no tea times. Ooh. So you can never be late. Okay, that's good for you. <laughs> okay, so I turn up, I had a busy day at work in the summer. I turn up at 5.45, get on the first tee, it's rammed. There's like 20 groups. Like, oh. But there's no, there's no... F- official first hole oh okay so you just jump out the way the holes navigate towards there's four or five different starting points okay so you might go well starting point number one's busy but starting point number three is quiet okay okay i do the entire golf course okay is one floodlit nice two has a retractable roof (laughs) (laughs) great the whole golf course Okay, yeah, that's that's definitely different. Okay. Going to so, cost a few quid. So if it rains, not an issue. If it's dark, not an issue. You know it would be quite good to fund that? When it does close, it could all be sponsors. Easy. So you're there playing, it's under the under the lights, it's under the dome, and they've got a big thing saying, title is the number one ball in golf. They can fund it if they want. They've and got the lo- two billion there's a local quid. rule. I mean, the roof's high. Oh, yeah. Really high. But local rule, if you hit the roof, you get to play your shot again. Yeah, you should get a medal if you hit the roof. <laughs> get a little award, I hit the roof. <laughs> So that's three, okay, so, yeah. Okay. Different. There's no limit on how many people can play in one group. Oh, okay. Okay. So, being an eight ball, what if I turn up in a one ball behind the eight ball? You, you can go and start in point number three. Oh, okay. Right. Yep. It's all covered. That's nice. Under the roof, under the lights. Okay. And also, it doesn't matter, you, nobody's right, ra- when you turn up at five o'clock after work, you're not racing to get round before it goes dark. There's no need to, because there's a roof and there's lights. Never goes dark. Right, right. Okay. Never goes dark. Okay. That's four. Give me the fifth point. Best to the last. The fifth point yep. is there's a halfway house between every green and tea. <laughs> <laughs> wow. There's 18 halfway houses. Nice. So, because it doesn't matter if you start on point three, starting point three, or starting point four, or starting point two. Well, your halfway house isn't the same as mine. You know, would, different that, ones. that makes sense. But I would like that if they were themed. So one's like an Indian. McDonald's, yeah, KFC, yeah, uh, Mexican, an Indian, Italian, sushi, yeah, pizzas, pastas, and everything's free. It's all included in your green fee, which is four million pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Not pay for the roof somehow. The roof don't pay for itself. So yeah, different. 
I did not think that the, the park in, in Salford down the road would fit all this. But you know, well, that's really good. That's insightful. And if, if you want to send your dream golf club to us, feel free. Uh, podcast and if, at and if, you want, if you want to fund Hooker's Lane with a roof, <laughs> g- give us a shout. Yeah. Um, wow. Just a quick one before we go on to the podcast then. Um, a couple of things. We last week said that if you were uh, an Apple listener of the podcast and you hadn't rated us and given us some feedback, then we would love it. The audience, you guys, absolutely came and nailed it for us. A huge thank you for that. It really helps um, boost the podcast up the charts. Now, I know to you listening, you don't care where the podcast sits in the charts. And really, to be honest with you, we don't massively care. However, it's, it is, Rick's nodding like mad. We do. We do like to see it high up. So we actually reached last week uh, in the UK, this is number seven for the whole of sport. So when you look at that and you think of all the different sports, there are and all the huge, huge podcasts. To get to number seven was amazing. That's massively helped, obviously, by you guys listening, but also by subscribing on Apple and, and rating it as well. So thank you so much. You guys are very, very good people. But Matt, cut to me. But seventh isn't good enough. <laughs> we want to be first in the whole of sport and the entirety of the world. So if you've not reviewed yet, make sure you review the podcast on Apple, everywhere else you yes. can review it. And also, big shout out, uh, we mentioned also last week, we were getting close to 100,000 subscri- uh, followers on Instagram. We did it. We've done it. We're 100,000. It's my last wish before Christmas to you, everybody listening and watching, go and subscribe to this, the actual podcast YouTube channel. We want to get over 200,000 subscribers nice. there. I mean, that... that gets You're us, clenching that fist very tightly. That gets us through <laughs> Christmas, okay? It does. That gets us through Christmas... And helps fund the roof of Hooker's Lane. Yeah, it does. Um, yeah. And by the way, all 200,000 subscribers get free membership. Yeah, so if it ever happens, you actually go, you bring this to evidence, you go, <laughs> this is like six years' time, Rick's gone really grey and old, and like he's there at this uh, Hooker's Lane, it's just took the life out of him, it's been a hard graft, it's cost £10 billion to set it up. <laughs> so much, so much. Hi, Rick. Hi, mate. Danny. Oh, I, I do know you, Danny. Yeah, 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 you're my member, are you? Yeah, yeah, you sent the podcast six years ago, episode 162, I was a member. Oh, right, yeah, come in. <laughs> what hole's the uh, pizza van on? Nine. <laughs> so it's not, there's no whole numbers, is there any more? So third stretch of loop down the road. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much, everybody. And also, for those of you that don't comment, don't like, um, don't subscribe, whatever, that's also not fine, but okay, we do appreciate the silent majority as well. But please do subscribe. Um, shall we get into the podcast with Ricky? Uh, if you must. <laughs> Joking. It's a very good one. I have heard it, really. Um, if I've not, I won't lie. I've heard half of it so far. I'm going to listen to the rest of it now in real time with everybody else. Okay. So sit um, back. Enjoy. Ricky Fowler. Ricky Shields. <clears throat> opening up Heartfelt Podcast all the way from Jupiter. Medalist. Enjoy. And don't forget, tomorrow is the match. Me versus Ricky. I'll take him down. Well, first off, Ricky, thanks for having us down here. I genuinely, this might be my favorite place I've ever been. It's a, it's a special place. Um, I've been a member here at, uh, I want to say I, I joined as a full member, I think it was back in 2012. Okay. Um, back then they kind of had just a limited amount of spots for, for tour pros and uh, I'd had a, you know, a couple good years on tour and I felt like this is a place that I'll really always want to be. So, um, yeah, joined as a as a full member and helped you know free up a another spot uh, on the pro side of things. But yeah, it's just a a good place to hang and play golf. There's you know it's not a it's not a country club. It's it's golf. It feels like it's got a really nice vibe to it. It does. Um, you know, everyone. I mean, show up, play, good food. Chef here is great. Um, later in the day, afternoon, you get handful of guys hanging out on the on the patio uh playing <laughs> cards having drinks and it's uh a lot of good people around here and uh i've been told that this golf course is outrageously difficult <laughs> you, you can make it difficult um <laughs> i feel like it's gotten easier over the years um i think this is the fourth version they've done okay. some redos some um you know norman did the original um and i think he was a part of the first and second renovation um but i yeah i've heard like the first couple were were very tough um they've they've cleared out some areas that used to just be like basically jungle 
Um, so yeah, it's a little bit more member friendly now. Okay. But still, um, you know, we've got a great t- day today. Oh, it's perfect. Um, but yeah, you'll get some days where it's it's blowing a proper fifteen to twenty, and it's it's about all you want. I suppose for you, when you want to practice and you want to test yourself, because obviously you test yourself on the hardest golf course week in week out on the mm-hmm. on the tour. You need somewhere that's going to test you all the time. You need a place that's to tour standard all the time, like this. You know, a golf course like here at Medalist. Yeah, this one for me, I feel like this one's a, a great place to kind of s- get a good test throughout the game. Um, you know, down here in Florida, we got some good tight grainy lies around greens, and you can really tell where your chipping game's at. Um, it'll tell you pretty quickly. Um, I, found, I, I found that out pretty quickly being here only a day. Yeah. Chipping's not my forte, and uh, this uh, this type of grass, Bermuda type mm-hmm. of grass, it's just, oh, you've really got to catch it perfect. Yeah, you'll, I mean, if you're chipping well around here, like I was out at Bears Club yesterday for, for a pro-am with uh, Jack and Barbara. And, oh, nice. Um, same thing just it's that tight and grainy and if if you're not delivering the club properly um i think the first hole we play we started on four yesterday um and i had this little like uphill in the rain shot and it was one of those ones where you just want to like close your eyes and luckily i hit it i was just trying to hit it to like eight ten feet yeah it was accomplished that but it was one you try and get cute with and hit it in the bunker and you can make a mess of it quickly you know, I think that'll be quite nice for people listening and watching the fact that even yourself, who's played golf to such an incredible level, been on tour since 2008, right? There's still shots around the golf course that kind of give you the, oh God, I'm not quite comfortable over this one or not oh, quite yeah. not quite feeling this type of shot. Because I think there's a lot of amateurs listening will just kind of presume a tour pro like you just takes it all in the stride and, you know, almost doesn't have those um, anxiety issues out on the golf course and things like that but it's probably not the truth is it really i would say i mean there's there's probably you know a few days a year playing in tournament golf where you really have no worry everything's clicking and and you're just rolling with it um there's plenty of times and i feel like um all all pros will be lying if there's never a situation where they don't feel a little (laughs) a little uh (laughs) not too sure about it um yeah it it happens but sometimes like it's just deciding how you handle those situations like sometimes there's if it's a shot and you may not feel too comfortable with it well you don't have to try and pull it off um and then there's other situations where this is the shot you have to hit and you just have to you know man up and and hit it step Um, up and and deliver so yeah there's but there's plenty of times where like you may not feel too comfortable and you just accept like okay well i'm either not going to get this that close yeah or you know you're kind of taking the big mistake or or big number out of play of course now we're straight off this podcast we're gonna grab some lunch and head out and i do a challenge on my youtube channel where i've been lucky enough to play against some incredible tour pros tommy fleetwood adam scott lee westwood and we do a 10 shot challenge. So I start okay. 10 on the par, you start level far. We play off the same tees, which when we just spoke a minute off, off camera, you were hinting at the back backs round here, right? We could. <laughs> it, I mean, it. we don't We don't have to, to go too crazy. The We're right here by the first and 10th tee. Um, luckily today, number one is down off the right, um, but it is, I believe it's about 275 carry. Okay. Um, <laughs> Good way to ease into the round. Yeah, it's... <laughs> It's, I mean, definitely I might, I helps might, when it's downwind. I might lose all, I might be mm-hmm. over par after the first hole after starting 10 under. I mean, one, I mean, we could always just like hit the shot, see it and go up to the, to the normal tees as well. That <laughs> yeah. one's up there. Normally it's like a, I'll hit five wood and a, and wedge or a nine flick. iron. Um, that's a little bit more of an inviting first hole. We'll see how, we'll see how we get on. I'm sure as the round's going on, if it's tight, you'll be like, we're going off the back tees. Get off the back on 10, get on the back of the rest of them. I would say, well, for the most part, um, the only ones that have like some back, back tees, one, um, nine, 10, and then 18. Okay. Um, outside of that, many. the normal back tees, uh, there's just a few few get, that get stretched out. I was mentioning before, you've been, you turned pro in 2008 right uh, 2009 tour, 2009 yep. and you've had a phenomenal career nine wins on on tour right and uh i think nine or so world i have five on tour 
nine like, worldwide wins somewhere around there i i just i need to get more that's <laughs> that's, that's what goal. it comes down to when you look back at that time frame and i want to talk about what the future holds as well like do you feel proud of what you've achieved do you feel like you've you've kind of hit what you'd want to or do you feel like there's a lot more to obviously play for and moving into the future obviously you're working hard on your golf swing at the moment mm-hmm. you know i'd love to dive into that a little bit with you as well when you look back at it at the moment do you feel that there's i don't know things that you're still grasping for and you still kind of aim for really in the world of golf uh there's kind of two ways to look at it because i feel like as a golfer you're you're never satisfied so always want more um it's never enough um I mean, you look at someone like Tiger when he was in his, you know, that stretch of the late 90s, early 2000s. Like, that's arguably some of the best golf we've ever seen yeah. and still wanted more. Still kept pressing different, working on different stuff to try and keep getting better. Um, and so I would say, like, sitting here today, yes, I've had a, you know, a nice career, but I want more. Um, but also on the flip side, if you were to, go back to me as a you know seven eight year old kid of having a dream of playing on the pga tour we've we've done just fine i mean having some wins winning a players championship um so probably have exceeded the initial dream of you know just being on the pga tour and winning um but like i said no one's ever satisfied um when you're in the current situation and and knowing where you are what you've done um so yeah, I always want more. I don't. I don't think you can ever be satisfied as as a tour pro because you need that drive. You know what's going to force you to practice. What's going to force you to keep pushing yourself. And you see that there's, there's certainly a um, a type of attitude with tour players that the it's an individual sport and you're in control of your own destiny. And you've got to set these targets. You've got to keep working towards you know improvement and getting better all the time. Um, and as I mentioned, you've been working really hard on your golf swing and working hard on mm-hmm. your technique. What's the, how's that all kind of come about? And, and how's that? How's the progress to that so far? Um, I mean, it's been it's been I mean good so far. Um, you know, to kind of go out with a few events this fall and and working on some changes and it has you know had two good finishes yeah um so that was definitely good to see and then i was able to get some time off spend some time with the family and just starting to kind of really get back to work now um so you know obviously didn't play very well the last few years um but i i i learned a lot um and so you know decided to go away from from john tillery who i I can't say enough good things about the guy love him um it was just a bummer that you know didn't wasn't really working it was you know in a way like kind of speaking different languages and we gave we gave it our best shot um you know i put i put a lot of work in um i he i know jt he was he was grinding was putting everything he had into you know trying to to make it work and um you know at the end of the day um just a a business decision on on my part and you know said you know kind of run its course and i need to go a different direction so um i thought kind of the easiest was going back to butch um a lot of people you know ask why i ever left him well butch stopped traveling so it wasn't it wasn't me necessarily leaving butch yes um and we've always maintained um communication always kept up with butch and stayed in touch but um even since technically starting to work with him the last few months i've only seen him once okay um and that was when i was in the tournament in vegas uh that week because he's out in vegas isn't mm-hmm. it so yeah i still don't i don't hardly see him it's more just text or phone calls sending videos back and forth um I've hit balls with his brother Craig here at Medalist. Yeah. Um, actually, we only did that once before I went out to Vegas, so it's it's a little bit more you know on me and just having the communication with Butch as well as Craig. I suppose you, you mentioned something really interesting just then, like the, talking about different languages, mm-hmm. and coaching can be like that. Mm-hmm. 
like you say, you can work with a particular coach and for, for whatever reason, the communication might be a little bit different, but then, you know, you go back to Butch and obviously you've had a great relationship with Butch over the years and, you know, it's maybe certain things that he's identified or communication, the way he puts something across, it kind of clicks again, doesn't it? And you go, okay, yeah, that makes that makes sense or whatever that may look like. Yeah, and I would say even, even a lot of it is I still have to give, you know, a lot of credit to, to JT too from, from what I learned about the swing and body and myself over the last few years kind of helped put me in the position um, for this fall where I was able to um, be in a better spot and then also accomplish some of the things that myself and Butch wanted to do with the swing. But I suppose as well, when you look at the last few years, like your life changed a lot. There's yeah, a few married, changes, get married, have a kid. Have a kid. You know, those things definitely affect your performance. You know, I'm sure your perspective on life might have even tweaked a little bit and change when you see the patter of little feet knocking around so i bet that's been kind of quite a big u-turn in your, in your in your daily lifestyle as well i guess yeah no it's i mean it's been fun i wouldn't i wouldn't change anything and um you know the bummer over those i would say over those few years is that like golf was the only thing that wasn't you know great everything else like at, at home and family friends like everything was amazing yeah. so at least i had you know that to to fall back on and lean on um it was just a bummer that you know things weren't clicking on the golf course and um it's nice to you know start to see that it's still in there we, we can still play so short-term goals obviously we're back in the 2022 now moving into next year do you are you quite religious in setting goals for the, the next year uh, that is that something you do on a yearly basis or are you more long-term projects five years ten years how do you kind of set your goals ready for the new season um sometimes i'll write things down sometimes i won't but um i mean for me i, I think the kind of easiest and most simple is win um you know i think we did a good job of, of getting in contention a couple times this yeah. fall and um no, I, I, I want to win. So we do that. That's going to help take care of a, a lot of other goals, but that would kind of be the initial. Um, but it's nice to be in a position where, you know, I, I feel like I can and know I can go back out and win because um, I obviously want to be back on, you know, President's Cup and Ryder Cup teams. And um, there's still a lot of, lot of stuff we want to accomplish. You've been obviously a radical player and you know that's obviously a totally different kettle of fish it's team golf do you have super fun memories of radical do you love kind of getting it playing in those and being part of the team oh yeah um i mean there's some of the the best memories as a as a professional golfer i think um you know being able to be on teams um you know playing with you know guys like jt and then you know guys that are, are good friends of mine but I've also enjoyed, I mean, just the weeks as a whole from being in the team room together, yeah. um, you know, having some drinks on Sunday night. And, you know, unfortunately, we've been on uh, Ryder Cups, more losing sides than winning sides. But um, it's still more of a, you know, afterwards, it's, you know, celebration of the accomplishment of obviously being on the team. Um, but it is more fun to have some drinks after you've won. I must admit the US, t U.S. team now, though, at the moment is incredibly strong. You know, yeah, you know, I got I to play my ass off to, <laughs> to get back on there because uh, we've got plenty of young talent, yeah. uh, a lot of guys playing really well, and it's fun to see. Um, that's, the, that's the way you want it. Um, you know, growing up, I always you know, played in practice with buddies that were good players, and um, people have always you know, kind of brought up, like, you know, I'm behind the green waiting for buddies to finish and yeah, win. Yeah. And it's like, well, it's fun that way because to me, it's the most fun when you beat your friends and kind of yeah. have like the bragging rights. Yeah. So when I've won and I've had friends there waiting for me, it's it's a kind of cool and fun accomplishment. And, you know, to have the respect between your peers um, and to be able to share those moments together. Um it's kind yeah, of like you're, you're all living the dream, you know. I'm, get, yeah. I'm guessing like Justin Thomas is a good friend of yours, mm -hmm. and John Spieth. Yep. Um, are, they, are they the main kind of best pals on tour? Yeah, those two. I mean, um, also really close with Jason Duffner. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm close to a lot of other guys, but yeah, I, was, I mean, JT and I probably spend the the most time together um, of those guys. You didn't grow up playing golf with those guys, though, did you? 
No, uh, JT and Jordan both a little younger than me. Yeah. Um, Duff's a little older. Um, there's a there's a handful of guys on tour that um, are around my age that I played some junior golf and college golf with. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what's fun is, you know, everyone's kind of part of a, a big family and, um, yeah, like I said, it's it's more fun when you're when you're beating your friends and kind of end up with the bragging rights. Who who out of those guys? takes it the the worst if you if you go out let's say you're going having a bit of a hit and giggle with jt and jordan whoever else like who who's a not a great loser if you kick their ass um i think everyone's about the same i mean <laughs> nobody likes losing obviously. no no they all hate it they love winning um i mean tiger could be up there as one of the the worst he hates losing which oh, really? obviously you know goes to show what he's accomplished over the years he's <laughs> He hates losing. He plays here as well, right? He does. That's crazy. And have you had some good challenges around here with him? We've had some some matches over the years. Um, <laughs> no, we've we've had a good time, and um, you know, I know he's been over the last couple of years when he's you know been healthy or trying to come back. This is this is where he kind of you know checks things, or you know, obviously with going through last injury, trying to you know go out and walk and and see how he's doing. So. Um, yeah, it's nice to have a place where, you know, Tiger feels comfortable to call this as, you know, his home course. I, um, just before we did this podcast, I put on, on my Instagram that I'm doing this podcast with you. What do you think was the most popular question to ask you? And I, can't, I couldn't believe the tidal wave of questions on this one particular topic. I have no idea. Why you wear orange? Which, I, which... I know the story of, but I'm surprised so many kind of so many questions came about this. Was that being that it was it more like non-US based? It, it could be. Maybe. I've got quite a, a okay. global reach, but maybe I know. I know you're you're kind of big time. <laughs> Don't be stupid. I didn't mean it like that. But I, said like, I didn't mean it like that. Sounded awful. But more like I've uh, got fans over in the US, but I think. In the certainly in the UK, the college system isn't anywhere close to what yeah, it is over yeah, here. Yeah, it's very different. I know, obviously, you know, outside of the US, it's very much you you go to college, you know, for you know what you want to do, yeah. life wise, in business or Correct. doctor or whatever it may be. Um, you know, our our sports in college are are a pretty big deal in the it's states. Huge you know, college football and basketball and on down the line, but. Um, you know, college golf is pretty big and a lot of the, a lot of the kids in the U S go play college golf before turning pro. And so the orange for me went to Oklahoma state yeah. and, um, our colors are, are orange and black and just thought it was, uh, kind of fun and different. Not many guys necessarily wore orange. So yeah. kind of a way to just kind of continue to be myself and not try and be someone else. Yeah. Like I said, I, I, I knew it was from Oklahoma state, yeah. but honestly, the amount of times like, why do we have orange? And it's, I suppose to some degree, it's probably what a lot of golfers, when they maybe think about yourself, Ricky Fowler, like wearing orange, mm -hmm. bright colors, you know, um, so it's not a bad thing. It, it's being able to stand out from the crowd a little bit as well. You know? Yeah. I always wanted to, you know, like the thing I mentioned earlier is like not trying to you know, necessarily be like someone else, just be yourself. I grew up riding and racing dirt bikes. Um, and with the, you know, riding gear is a little bit more, can be on the louder side fun and, you know, whether it's colorful or not, but it's not just plain necessarily. So having kind of the action sports background and, and just not being afraid to wear some loud colors or, or different outfits. Um, that was more just me having fun and being myself. Do you ever get time to do any of that now with motorsports or other stuff, hobbies outside of the world of golf? Uh, not much. Um, you know, riding, I, I wish I could. I just don't really have the, the time to do it. And is it is it a bit risky as well if you did it, do you know? Yeah, it is, you can't it go is injuring yourself. Because um, it'd be hard for me to just go cruise around and, and not do anything that, that has some risk because it would, it would kind of be like telling someone that's a scratch golfer to, to just – go out and shoot 90 to 95 and have fun like yeah you want to go play golf so like if i get on a bike you know i was a decent rider so i'd want to go ride to my abilities and um just not that fun that way well the thing is you, you like I say if you push yourself too far over and you have a bad accident that could mm -hmm. be you know really horrendous for obviously your golf career yeah and riding it's it's not a matter of of if it's it's when it's <laughs> that's a good point yeah like it's 
playing golf. The crash like, is going to happen. Yeah, like it's like trying to go around and not hit a ball in the water or hit a bad shot. Like <laughs> it's going to happen at some point. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's just not necessarily worth the risk right now. So what else then did you enjoy? What takes your mind off golf? Obviously, spending time with family. I'm sure. Is there any other hobbies that you? passionate about uh family's been really the the main thing um i enjoy when i get some little bit of free time around the house i'll, I'll fish out back um and then when we're home i'm usually in the gym uh, probably about six days a week um and then my wife and i enjoy cooking at home nice so that kind of you throw some playing or practicing and uh, it kind of fills up the day that's your day done and have you always been super into kind of the fitness obviously the golf development of fitness and strength and powers really come in really kind of obviously since tiger hit the scene and mm -hmm. obviously there was a dominance of distance is that always something you've been quite passionate about or do you do you enjoy it or do you have to force yourself to go and get in the gym uh it's a little bit of both i i i do enjoy it but i'm not i'm not in there pushing myself or or in the gym to necessarily look a certain way yeah. um i still want to enjoy life and you know have a drink here or there, yeah. eat some unhealthy food. Um, but it's more about, you know, making sure that my body is capable of what I want it to do. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm not in there to try and make myself look a certain no. way. It's, you know, I'm in there to, to play golf and, and to play for a long time. So so it's more, yeah, so it's, it's looking after conditioning your body. Mm -hmm. But are you doing anything that's kind of helping you hit the ball further? Are you doing anything that's helping the performance out on the golf course as well? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's all based around golf and, and physical yeah. health. Um, you know, I'm not trying to necessarily make any crazy gains on distance or anything like that. Um, Have you ever chased that? No, I mean, I've always been above average. Um, and I, I, I don't have any aspirations to really try and push it too much. No. Um, I, I just don't know. I don't necessarily see the, the real benefit in it. Yeah. Um, and more so just focusing on, you know, the things that I may not be as good at, make those better and, and continue to, to strengthen my strengths. I've always, I always love asking this question to, to really, really good golfers because we, a lot of young golfers, aspiring tour pros will be listening right now. Okay. And obviously the education of practice has improved a lot of golfers mm -hmm. now listening know how to practice better have you got any top tips for kind of young aspiring golfers and whether that's to be on tour or whether that's just to get better where, where would you kind of focus your attention on, on as a a more of a of a broader answer to how people can improve effectively um i think i mean outside of doing your your basics uh, and putting and chipping kind of hitting your fundamentals there but for me and the way I have kind of always gone about it, especially once I was able to, to get to a golf course and, and utilize actually playing, um, is playing golf. A lot of times, you know, I'll warm up, get a little bit of work on the range, but get out and go play golf. Um, and then whatever I may struggle with out there, if it's a certain shot, um, then I can, okay, I'm going to go work on this at the range. Um, I think a lot of people can spend too much time on the range yeah. and playing range golf versus playing actual golf is very different. So yeah. playing puts you in a lot more situational, um, positions of, you're not just hitting the same shot over and over. Um, you're not always hitting the full shot. So to me, it's play golf. Okay. What did I struggle with? I'm going to go work on that. And then address it. Well, you're right. So many, you know, golf, the range, there's no consequence. It's really easy to hit a good drive on the range. Yeah, of course it is. Because you've got another ball. There's, no, there's nothing that's, that's not water, right? Yeah. There's not a 275-yard carry on the first hole. There's not trees. There's yeah. no there's no, um, there's no consequence. Yeah, but it's like, yeah, if you maybe struggled with, you know, holding a left or right wind that day or flighting the ball, whatever it may be, then, okay, I'm going to go work on these specific things um, versus sometimes unless you're working on like a, a swing change that needs reps but you know I feel like people go to the range without much of an idea of what they're going to do other than just hit balls um, and you end up either in a worse spot or searching yeah. um, go play okay these are the one two three things I struggle with I'm going to go work on this did you start playing golf really young I, yeah, I, I started 
hitting balls and playing at two. Oh, wow. um, I played my first tournament at four and a half. Oh my goodness. So yeah. And parents into golf, I guess. Uh, a little bit. My grandpa was the one who introduced me. Oh, right. Um, and so he, he picked up the game uh, as well as my dad. Um, it, we all kind of started around the same time. My grandpa took me to the driving range when I was two and, uh, it kind of just immediately fell in love with it. Wow. Um, with it, let's say hypothetically we're, we're sat here in 10 years time. Okay. What do you see? the pathway for the next 10 years what would you love to have accomplished what what would you love to be saying that my now my greatest achievement is um well, i'd like there to be at least one major yeah. um i i definitely you know we talked about goals you know a win and, and going from there but i need to i need to win some more um to to feel you know satisfied or at least somewhat satisfied like we said no one's ever ever fully satisfied you no. always want more but even if you won one i bet you're like well, maybe yeah, exactly get two yeah and... so i mean having one would be great that's at least uh you know ticking that box but you always want more what's been the hard because obviously you've come second in three of the majors and third in the other what's been the hardest one to kind of swallow what was the hardest one to go ah that was um that annoyed me i would say I would say Valhalla PGA was was probably my my best shot. Um, you know, I felt like I I hit a lot of quality shots. And what year was that again? Sorry, I think it was fourteen. Okay, but Rory won. Um, so the year before you won the players. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I could, I could be wrong um, around that time. But yeah, that one I I was in a great position going to the back nine. Um, I had a couple swings that that. I guess you could say they cost me. They might not have. You never yeah. know. But um, that was probably the one I felt best and was either in the lead or close enough in, in certain points where that was the one I felt like I had a very good chance. There was others. Um, you know, at the Open, I finished second to Rory. I, I He played well, and I never got close enough. Was that Roy Liverpool? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's where it is again this year? Yeah, and then 2023. U.S. Open at Pinehurst, Keimer was way out front. Yeah, um, I was never necessarily going to catch him. He needed to come back a little bit yeah. so that I could catch that. Um, and he just played solid golf, so I was never in a in a spot where I could get there. Um, and then obviously I had a great chance at the, at the Masters uh, when Patrick Reed won. So 2018, I was there for that one. I think so. Yeah, I'm, I'm terrible with 2018 with years and stuff, but yeah, I was there. Um, that was one where I was chasing and, and kind of got to a point where I had a chance. Um, Patrick ended up, I think, making par on the last two. Yeah. Um, so I lost by one. But like I mentioned, I, I think Valhalla was the one where I had an actual chance, um, where I had some control. And the things like that, when do you, do you use that for fuel to motivate you to, to get out and practice? Do you use all those kind of near opportunities to, to really – force yourself to get out there and practice because obviously you want to get those off off your back you want to forget about those and obviously remember the the, the phenomenal victories yeah because there's 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 certain shots in those um moments whether it's the back nine or whatever it may be knowing the ones that you hit how you wanted to and they're executed it's hard to say perfectly but what you're trying to do and then there's the others where like is either poor swing or, or bad mental commitment and trying to figure out, okay, why we did so well here, what, why we struggle or make a mistake here. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's something you look back and kind of try and pull on the memories of the good ones and then remember, you know, the poor ones as well. Cause okay, what happened here? What I do, how, how can I do better in that situation? Um, it's just dawned on me. I want to thank you for something. RF, 33s mm-hmm. your irons the super super bladed ones mm-hmm. the ones that you 33 iterations they killed it on my channel oh really yeah i made two videos about them and i went and played golf with them struggled like hell because they're like the smallest bladed irons yeah, i've yeah. ever seen in my life and it was in like lockdown when i got the first time i got a hold of them and the beautiful looking yeah. irons you had you had obviously the saying that yeah um, yeah is, is there going to be another version because you're, you're not currently playing with those are you i'm not i went to i ended up going to a, a set of irons that's coming out next year a little more uh 
They're a little bigger, a little more forgiving. Um, yeah, those blades were ridiculous. <laughs> they're yeah, they're they're definitely on the edge. Um, <laughs> yeah, the I I feel like what I want or what the ultimate goal we were trying to just take the the blades that I was playing and just give them a, a little different look. Yeah. Um, the sole turned out a little bit different and wasn't necessarily working the, the same. And yeah. so that's where I struggled. So the, the ball flight ended up being a little different. Um, the look, looking down on them is, is what I wanted. They, they're they obviously fun to look at. Um, the three iron's not. <laughs> for, for some people, they may not be fun to look at and hit. Um, yeah, they're, uh, it'd be fun to work on version two they may not be blades they may be um with the technology and all the all the stuff that manufacturers know now um you can make you know more forgiving clubs that still feel and and get the consistency of blades um you, so i think that's the equipment i am um not necessarily messing around and tinkering too much uh, i like to kind of get my set and, and go. Um, I don't like making many changes. You tweaked with a few putters last year, was it? Or this year? You uh, this this last year, yeah. Um, and again, that's something I don't necessarily like to do, but trying to, when something's not necessarily working or isn't looking right to the eye, sometimes changes need to happen and yeah. just find something that looks good and gives you more confidence. Um, but yeah, ultimately, I like to kind of stay away from doing a lot of changes yeah i think putters is one though you can kind of tweak and sometimes you'll just put a new putter in the bag mm -hmm. and it, oh yeah i like the look of that and it just yep. gives you that little bit of confidence yep. um one of the i've got some fan questions i want to go through in a minute uh, but one one for me and again something i in integrated into my i probably need to redo this again i remember seeing a video of you obviously hover the putter at, mm -hmm. at setup um and i found that i'm going to do it today actually now i've remembered I sometimes kind of forget these things. It felt like it'd take a lot of tension out of your hands and it felt like it was easier to take the putter away because you weren't almost lifting it off the floor before you took it back. Yeah, so it was something, um, Paul Vazanko, who kind of, he runs kind of the, the fitting and, and the studio for, for Scotty down there um, in, in Southern California. I got to spend a lot of time down there growing up and, and through high school and college. And um, it was one of the things kind of messed with because, when you look at when the when the putter's sold, um, to take it back, there has to be either some sort of lift or you have to take it up and outside. Yeah. Um, unless you're on super fast greens with no friction, you can actually slide it and take it straight back. But there is some sort of lift of, and mine was a touch of a lift and it would be just a touch outside. So um, we did some video work and was looking kind of just thought well what if i hover a little bit yeah and try that and it just flowed straight back because you don't have you're already lifted so you're, you're good to go um it is an odd feeling at first it takes a little bit of practice because you do have to you kind of lose and you know an anchor point yes um people don't think they're putting necessarily weight on their putter uh, but if it's sold it is kind of a form of of an anchor on the ground um no matter if you're pushing down or not. Yeah. So it, it did clean up the stroke for the takeaway, um, which if you have a, a bad takeaway, you can you can fix it and, and putt well from there, but um, was just trying to make it as clean as possible. I suppose the, the one thing that you find a bit more challenging when you hover it is to make sure that the ball stays in the middle of the face still. Because it feels yeah. like it can almost go towards toe and heel a little bit more, the putter. Yeah, and it's, it's a little bit of the yeah balance and being able to kind of, hold everything steady um it can get a it can get a little tough when it's a little breezy um <laughs> but you just got to put the reps in i suppose you don't i don't know obviously there are windy places out here but i suppose that really kicks in when you're over at the open the, yeah i mean it, it does get it can get pretty windy down here i mean i would say you know an average day blows 10 to 15 um but we get plenty of days that are over 20 um but yeah, uh, you don't play in proper windy conditions until you go overseas. I've got some questions. Okay, uh, this is from Tom. <laughs> we'll start off with a good one. Tom Fox Dean, have you ever had a sausage roll? I have. Here in the U.S. or just in no, the not here in the not here in the U.S. You like them? Yeah, no, I've I've gotten them uh, <laughs> from like some of the little stands over at the open. Yeah, yeah, they're the, like a halfway house. Mm -hmm. They're just the best. We do like a. I'm guessing they don't sell them here. 
Not, not really. There's, there'd be versions <laughs> that could be close to it, but um, yeah, they're. I wouldn't say they're necessarily good for you, but they, they do taste nice. Uh, Alex uh, Cod has said you can pick you and three others for a scramble. Okay, who are you picking? And you know what? I'm going to open it up. It's going to be past and present too. Mm. I'm guessing the guy you were with yesterday might even make it in, Mr. Nicholas. Ooh, I think I think for me, past, present, that's a hard one because if it was a five ball, it'd be pretty easy. Go on then. You can have five. Okay. It'd be, I'll go Hogan, Nicholas, Tiger, and then one of my favorites, Arnold Palmer. Be pretty good, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, that'd be quite a good one just to sit back and watch. Yeah, I'd I, I even just spectate and yeah, have a exactly. few cocktails and watch those four. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll film it. You can you can spot tight. Um I'm gonna extend on that a little bit more. Let's say you now we're going out playing, okay? And you could pick a player to hit to for example, pick a player to hit all the tee shots, mm-hmm. pick a player to hit all the iron shots, pick a putter. What would the four ball but look like then? And also you you've got to pick a part for you. Okay. Um I'd say driving it's gonna be pretty easy. We'll take Rory. Okay. Um, iron play, Tiger. Um, short game. I'm gonna go with JT. Okay. I love I love the way he chips and pitches the ball and hits you know wedge shots from really any wedge shots and around the green. Um, so I guess I have to go myself putting. Uh, hasn't exactly been my strong point the last couple of years, but I know I'm a good putter. Yeah, I feel like that's that has been your strong point yep. over the years. Definitely. Well, that's, that's the other tough part with the last three years is working on stuff and when even when there's days where i've had decent or good ball striking i've always been able to rely on my putter and that's something through the early part of my career like my putter was always there so if i had a bad ball striking day i could kind of manage and save it when i had good days i made putts um unfortunately last few years i i really didn't make anything so even if i hit the ball well i just got nothing out of it and you need to, obviously, it's such a huge part of it. Ben Adams has put, what's your favorite tattoo? Favorite tattoo? How many, um, how many did you have? I think seven. My favorite's probably the first one I got. Um, it's my coach from growing up. So it's, it's his, like, he used to do a lot of pencil drawings, um, and he would sign it um, in pencil, Barry McDonald. Um, so I got his name tattooed on my wrist. That was the that first was one you first had? One. Wow. Is that because of how much influence he had over you? And yeah, I mean, I, I spent, I mean, my whole childhood growing up, uh, he was a big Ben Hogan guy. Um, always had the little five lessons Ben Hogan book in his back yeah. pocket. Um, and so super old school. Um, yeah, he unfortunately passed away um, right before I won my first pro event oh. um, in 2011. But uh, yeah, huge part of why I am who I am and why I'm where I'm at. I love the Olympic rings. Yeah, I do too. Unfortunately, I have to cover them up for a lot of shoots because um, you can't have the the rings visible. And um, oh, because it's like a trademarks logo. Yeah. So I did love you know, it. Did you know that before you had it done? Not, com- not completely. Um, so I do love the tattoo. I think knowing what I know now, I probably would have done it in a different position somewhere, or s- different on your spot. back or whatever. Um, so yeah, it is a great memory, but, um, it's been a bit of a hassle with, with all the shoots having to cover it up. Um, this is another random one. This is from Hunter Johnson. Obviously you've had a tash in the past. Mm-hmm. Okay. But can you grow a full beard? I, I can't really, um, sideburns don't grow. Okay. So I'm, I'm blank here. Um, and I would, it's, I would never be able to get to where you're at. <laughs> Um, I didn't know I could get to where I was at until it started growing. Yeah, no. I was like, hold on, it's quite decent. It's <laughs> kind of what you've seen is about as much as I get. Um, yeah, I don't get full coverage. Another question, this is just from a username, Legatron. Um, will Dick Fowler PI ever make another appearance? Not sure. That was with Farmers. Actually, that was a fun one to shoot. Um, we shot like four spots in one day messing around. And... Um, yeah, they just decided not to, to move forward with it, but I, I wouldn't be against uh, yeah, it was quite, it was funny doing happened. some random funny videos. And the golf boys. Whew. 
That's that was mad. It was, you know, that was just showing that we're weird and like to goof around as well. Showing um, personalities. Yeah, I, I know I'm not a good singer. I'm <laughs> definitely not a good dancer, but <laughs> all you have to do is just let loose and goof around, and we had some fun with it. Were you uh, were you well oiled for that shoot? No, none of you us were sober. Yeah. Wow. That was that was the four of us dead sober. What's happened to Ben Crane's mad videos? Cause he oh was, man, he the, was doing some funny videos, the workout videos and stuff he started with. And when he when he was talking about how to read greens and he was yep. jumping in the near pond and all sorts. Unfortunately, like they're they're funny if you don't know anything, but if you're a golfer and him kind of making fun of all the the golf stuff, it made it that much more funny. Uh, someone's asked another random. What's your second favorite color? The presuming orange is your favorite color. I'm um, probably going blue. Okay. Um. I remember growing up, blue was like one of my favorite colors. I think I had my room painted blue as a kid. Uh, this is from a, a username that doesn't really make sense for a name, but anything, and I'm glad this has come from a fan, anything you regret over your career? Uh, no, because I think it's it's wrong to live with regrets. Um, I think the big thing for me is always kind of, if there was a spot where I messed up or made a mistake is just learning from that and yeah. either not letting it happen again or okay what do i need to do in the the next time we're in that situation of course so no if uh i wouldn't be where i am today if if all of that stuff didn't of course. happen uh we're gonna do a couple more uh andre grooves says what's your best course you've ever played at um That's tough. There's there's a handful. I Royal County Downs one of my favorites. Yeah, it's on, I've not played it, but it's on my bucket list. Yeah. yeah oh, if you get it on a day like this or with a little bit of breeze, <laughs> it, it's hard to beat. Um, you can get some nasty days where it may not be very fun. Of course. Yeah, I know. It, it looks absolutely out of this world. Yeah, it Link, really does. Links Golf's my by far my favorite. I think it's well. Obviously, we we get very lucky to get a lot of Links Golf mm-hmm. where we are, and uh, it took me a while to appreciate links golf i used to think it was really unfair i used to think it's yeah, not it just gives you so many so many options like you can still play it like a, a normal golf course you can play the ball in the air if you want to but you don't have to you can you can hit so many different shots and yeah, you're gonna get some you might get some breaks here and there but it's just part of it well, i think i mean the why I like links golf is you can use bloody putter everywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I'd love yeah. the fact you could, you know, out here you're gonna have to chip a lot of shots, and you know it's yeah, tough. You can you can putt it from on the greens a bit out here. Um, it's pretty tight and fast everywhere. Our our, our super um, Jason is incredible. Um, so you'll see. I mean, we've got a. I think yesterday probably uh, vertic cut and top dress, so you're seeing a little bit of nice sanding on the top. So these will be, they should be rolling today. Last question. Um, this is from uh, Max Hume. What do you think of the state of professional golf right now? It's it's very interesting. Um, I think ultimately it's going to end up in a better position for the players, hopefully for everyone in the whole game of golf. Um, it's it's I've enjoyed kind of learning more about the ins and outs of of the PJ Tour as well as live. Um, I'd say it's kind of unfortunate that something like live had to, you know, come to fruition to make the tour, you know, get up off their chair and, you know, do something. Um, you know, I've always believed that the PJ tours, the has been the best place to play currently is. And, you know, a lot of us want to see it continue to be that, um, but yeah, you can, you can't really just stay the same and expect to be the best. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been super interesting. Um, I think a lot of people thought that you know, live wasn't going to work or going to happen. Um, so yeah, there's you can go into a lot of it. But imagine like, imagine if live was backed by like Apple or Amazon. Because yeah, I, um, I I also don't necessarily like that the kind of the one stance is just going after kind of the the moral issue and being associated or with Saudi it's like 
no one's no one's perfect no one's clean um yeah it is what it is it's been an unbelievably interesting year Mm -hmm. you're right you know when you when you first look at whenever it was the first tournament back over in london you think i wonder how this is all going to kind of come out how it's all mm-hmm. going to go go ahead and and you know it like I say it probably has made certainly from a player standpoint they're in a much stronger position than they ever have been and mm-hmm. uh, they've got cho- choices and it sounds like the pga tour are obviously doing things to to keep everybody and you know make it better for for the players inevitably yeah everyone's everyone's trying um when we talked about like swing wise and all that and golf like you're never satisfied you always want yeah. more so it's like you know the tour is being pushed right now um the players want what's best so everyone's learning and everyone's trying to move forward do you think there needs to be a time where the tours need to meet i think i think the meeting should have taken place four or five years ago when yeah. this all kind of came about and that was um that was the the tour's first mistake was was not meeting whether you agree or not um at least having the you know either heard the info or gotten you know the info for yourself um, and going from there, uh, I think maybe in a little different position than we are today. Um, right. Should we head out on the golf course? I say we get some food first and then we'll go. I, I honestly, I, don't, I feel quite relaxed at the moment, but I genuinely believe some of that first tee today, that might be the most daunting tee shot I've ever faced in my life. I'll just imagine if it was in off the left, <laughs> least, yeah, least we got, the right. not much breeze, but at least we got some help. I just, I just think this place is just magical. You, you're very, very lucky down here in Jupiter and yeah. all the different golf courses you've got. Yeah, when this is when this is our our winter weather, um, yeah, it's 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 hard to beat. And I honestly like the summers down here even more, just because it's there's less people. Um, yeah. I mean, the peop, Jupiter and Palm Beach and everything down here, a lot of people come down to spend the winters um, to get out of the cold. Um, so there's there's less people around, and it's a little bit more of a, a locals town uh, here in the summer. Is it not baking though? I've it's warm, but you used know, to it. I, I wouldn't say necessarily that the UK gets that warm, but um, <laughs> you know, for the most part, unless you go up and high in the mountains, like everywhere is pretty warm um, yeah. in the summer. So uh, get out, go play in the morning. Usually, be inside, work out in the afternoons. Um, now it's. Like the Bahamas is sixty miles dead east, at least right. uh, the northwest part of them. So it's it's pretty tropical. We yeah. usually get um, little ocean breeze. So yeah, it's hot and humid, but we put up with it. <laughs> with the hell you put up with it? We've literally been here two days, and we're like, right, we need an office over here. We need to have a base over here because it's just it's just delightful. Yeah, we kind of forget all these amazing places. Uh, Ricky, you've been amazing. Let's go and grab some food. Let's get on the golf course. Sounds good. Thanks. Bro.